We got us some bush rangers and some bloodborne. Hello and welcome to Bush Rangers and Bloodborne. I am your host Smokey and joining with me as always is my co-host Booge. Hello. And this is the series where we go over some Bush Rangers and play a little bit of Bloodborne. Yeah. Today we will be going over the Three Franks. These. Oh uh, yes, the classic three yeah. three. The classic three Franks. Yes. Kind of hard to say. <laughs> uh, they this out of the list of Bush Rangers that we had. That these are literally the only people that. It was named Frank, so I was like, uh, might as well slap them in one episode, especially. We don't have much information on any of them. Gotcha. Uh, the first Frank we're going to start with is a Frank McCohen, or better known as Francis McNannis McNeil McCohen. <laughs> <laughs> or Captain it, Melville, uh, born yeah. circa 1823. Uh, that's the, we only know the year. He was a Scottish-born Australian notorious bush ranger during the early part of the Victorian gold rush in Australia. And if you're an Australian uh, like rock band, garage rock band, uh, Captain Melville is a good uh, band name for you. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, yes, let's get into it. Um, we're gonna start with, uh, after being convicted under the alias Francis Melville, McCollin was transported to Tasmania, there, then known as Van Damien's Land, by the <laughs> Manvere in 1838. He was aged. I think it's Van Diamond. Van Diamond, yeah, Van Diamond. I I just didn't want to say the cringy ass fucking Diamond, okay? <laughs> That's <laughs> <laughs> like here the Okajima must the time travel to name that one. <laughs> <laughs> I want Hideo Kojima's Bush Ranger series. <laughs> <laughs> All right, he was aged fifteen at the time, uh, having been convicted at. Perth at on October third, eighteen thirty six, of house breaking and sentenced to seven years transportation. The convict mm. records show that whilst Melville was under sentence, he was extraordinarily insubordinate. So much so that his sentence was extended to life. He continued Damn. to regularly appear before the magistrate up until 1850. Somehow he managed to escape and arrived in Melbourne around <clears throat> October 1851. Back when you could still escape out of places. I yeah, mean, relatively, it happens occasionally. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't think uh, we... I. We're not going to get into it. We're, we will, of course, get into it, but not just yet. But there is something that alludes that his freedom was not true freedom for him. Mm. Uh, gotcha. But yes, uh, his bush ranging uh, during 1852 as Captain Melville... He was alleged to have led a large band of bush rangers on the roads in the Black Forest between Melbourne and Bendigo, and gained a folkloric reputation through the boldness of his outrages and the cavalry he showed to many, especially women. Basically, he was a douchebag. Ah. His name was associated with the Nelson robbery and St. Kilda Road robberies, probably without foundation, as in reality he seems to have spent most of his time bailing up diggers around Mount Macedon, either on his own or with one or two mates. On Christmas hmm. Eve, 1852, when under the alias of Thomas Smith, 
that is like the most basic <clears throat> name you could have created. <laughs> he he said maybe John would be too uh, would be too oh, obvious. Would. I'm gonna say, it's, I'm gonna say Thomas. I would say <laughs> back then, John. We will cover that. There's so many Johns. Almost every episode, every three man episode after this will have a at least one John in it. That's how common that name was. Lots of Johns. Wait, there there will be a lot of Johns. So I, <laughs> I, if that was his train of thought, good on him at least. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas. <laughs> He and fellow Bush Ranger William Robert Roberts were arrested at a brothel in Cerro Street, Gilog, and eventually faced Judge Raymond Barry at the Geelong Circuit Court on February 3rd, 1853, on three counts of robbery. Barry sentenced both men to 12, 10, and 10 years on each count, respectively, in Melville's case, to be served consecutively. Hey, that ain't bad. Hey, mm -hmm. yo, that means you got like a maximum of 12 years, dude. So, could have been worse. You could be serving fucking 32 years. True. But you gotta escape. <laughs> of course, of course. They, I mean, we wouldn't be covering him if he didn't escape. <laughs> <laughs> if this was the end of his career, he wouldn't even be a notorious bush ranger. That would have been it. <laughs> <laughs> Although employed in chains on the roads of Victoria by the time of the Melbourne private escort robbery of July 20th, 1853, Captain Melville's name had been associated with it over the years because of the coincidence of one of the escort robbers george melville using the same surname as his alias oh that is bullshit getting by getting fucking blamed by association goddamn other melville <laughs> george melville the melvin uh, of melvilles <laughs> <laughs> On October 22nd, 1856, he w was one of a party of prisoners based on the prison hulk success in Port Fel Phillip Bay who attempted to seize and escape in a boat during which a warden, Owen Owens. What is with all these repeat names? We had Robert Roberts and now we got Owen Owens? Are we, g <laughs> <laughs> Are we gonna have a John Johns? <laughs> Or Stephen Stevens. <laughs> a, a fellow convict Stevens died. Steve, I guess it was just Stevens. I guess his name was just... Oh, just dude. Imagine being fucking born in a time where your name is literally just Stevens. Uh, yeah, Stevens. <laughs> Ste Stephen what? Uh, just Stevens. Stevens. Just Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Stevens had jumped overboard and drowned. Oh, no, Stevens! <laughs> uh, sentenced to death, but overturned because all prisoners involved all claimed that Stevens stuck the killer blow, thus creating doubt. Melville was then sent to Old Burn. Apparently, apparently, I looked this up, this is just jail? This is just an old way of spelling jail. G the G A O L that 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 th that's not what I was pronouncing. I've been pronouncing that wrong, and that's just jail. That's just oh. a very old timey way of spelling jail. And whoever old the fuck Melbourne used to spell jail. jail like that, <laughs> thank you for at least sounding it out. <laughs> jail. <laughs> jail. <laughs> I like that there's no explanation on here. It's just, they just expect us to be like, yeah, yeah, you know, jail. <laughs> yeah, you know, how, you know that, that that's how it is. Uh, in late uh, July 1857, he attacked Mr. Wintle, the governor of the jail, with a sharpened spoon, causing a deep <laughs> cut behind Mr. Wilton's. And that's the first game of Knifey Spoonie <laughs> <laughs> to ever be recorded. <laughs> And the spoon won. 
No, the spoon <laughs> won. He cut the dude's ear off with the fucking spoon. Yeah, I was saying the, the guy lost at the game of knifey spoon. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... Melville had been found dead in his bed on August 10th, 1857 with a large handkerchief tied around his neck. It would have been a slow death. There was a handkerchief about two yards in length twisted very tightly around his neck. The first <laughs> turn being made as a slip knot. It was afterwards turned around very tightly and then intucked in under the folds. The cause Epstein. of death... <laughs> The cause of death was uh, suffocation caused by the handkerchief around the neck. <laughs> there, there is very little doubt <laughs> that the handkerchief was applied by the deceased oh. himself. You, what, what do you, what do you think, Doc? You made, what do you, you think, Doc? <laughs> uh, that, that, that handkerchief, that, uh, uh, yeah, that, that killed him. <laughs> 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 Definitely Epstein. <laughs> like, I I hate how they they make it slow to. Do, I don't think he would have. I don't think su. I it's hard to. I don't think this was suicide, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to to be honest, it sounds. While he's tying the slip knot would be about the time his brain would be like, the fuck you doing, man? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I can't say his mindset at the time, but <sighs> usually you want it to be quick and painless. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like, or at least if it was going really slow, you'd probably be like, you'd probably stop in the middle of it and be like, let's do this better. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, 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 I'm, I'm it's definitely gonna... something sus there. <laughs> definitely <laughs> sus, especially because it was with a two yard. A... That's fucking a lot of handkerchief, man. Yeah, who, who's, that? who's got the sniffles that bad? <laughs> like, like, a two yard long handkerchief. Why the fuck is your handkerchief so goddamn long? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just thinking of them having like a, like, going over a list of suspects. You have a long line and everybody looks normal, but then there's there's one sinister looking guy with a gigantic nose. <laughs> 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 looking around shifty eyed. <laughs> oh, that is unfortunately all we have on Frank McCullman. Uh, that, that's it. Uh, apparently, uh, died of suicide. Uh, apparently in prison. I thought he would die a free man. <laughs> I like, I like how they didn't even put it down of, like, death of suicide. It was pretty much exactly death by handkerchief. <laughs> <laughs> Suffocation <laughs> with, <laughs> from handkerchief. <laughs> <laughs> It's Australia, like, even the handkerchiefs are dangerous. <laughs> you gotta stay away. It's not just the uh, spiders and snakes. <laughs> oh, shit. But, uh, that's not the only Frank that we have here. Uh, we have a Frank Pearsons. I, I like this one. Uh, he was an Australian bush ranger operating uh, just, under just, the Just pseudonym. Pearson. Pearson? Not Pearson. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's no, no Pearsons. Yeah. It's no S at the end. Thank you for great. Uh, so this would be Frank Pearson. He uh, was an Australian bush ranger operating under the pseudonym Captain <laughs> Starlight. <laughs> See, that's when when uh, Captain Melville, when that band breaks up, then like the two main members come back together and uh, they start their band Captain Starlight. <laughs> and it's a weird pop techno band. <laughs> yeah, it's completely different direction. <laughs> Uh, Pearson claimed he was the inspiration for a fictional figure of the same pseudonym, the character Captain Starlight in Rolf Baldwood's novel of 1882-1883, Robbery Under Arms. Baldwood hmm. 
who presumably had some insight into the matter, denied the claim and stated that the character was a composite of several bush rangers of the era, including Henry Redford and primarily Thomas Smith, uh, alias Captain Midnight. Ah, uh, that you know hmm. that was a fruity one. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Midnight, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like he, th- he. It took him a long and hard to earn the the respect to be called Captain Midnight. <laughs> it's literally you have you have the day man and night man. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> The cattle thief Redford did not use a pseudonym himself and had no connection with Captain Starlight until the author indicated a possible influence. Uh, Pearson's early life is a mystery as he gave a range of different versions of his background. He fucking jokered it. Fucking jokered it. See why I like this guy? (laughs) In his mm-hmm. early prison records, he claimed he was born in London and that he had arrived in Australia in 1866. Later, he claimed to be from America. <laughs> he also told friends that he was born in Mexico of a Spanish mother and Irish father. He, was, <laughs> he used so many aliases that his origins are obscure. However, he may have been connected to a family with the surname Arnold. <laughs> well, that narrows it down. <laughs> <laughs> Whichever one. <laughs> um, all right, uh, get, let's get in his notoriety. In September, uh, eighteen sixty-eight, as Doctor Frank Pearson. <laughs> <laughs> Where did he get the doctor from? <laughs> Yo, it's just one of his fucking aliases, dude. <laughs> I like that it's just his own name, but he added doctor. Yes. I'm going to be a doctor this go around. Who, you know, who's going to stop him? Who the fuck is going to stop Captain Starlight from calling himself doctor? That'd be like, oh, I'm going to do an alternate. I'm going to do a different alias from Spooge. I will be Dr. Spooge. <laughs> and no one, no one will ever know. <laughs> Uh, yes. uh, he teamed up with stockman chair uh charlie is that how is that charlie yeah charlie that's okay a, that, charlie that's, a, that's another way you could draw, yeah all right he he teamed up with stockman charlie rutherford and robbed the shop the yaberham post office uh y- yaramba yaramba yeah yaramba yaramba <laughs> <laughs> post office and Angel Deuce Dual Station in New South Wales before heading to... Goddamn, I really hate Australian names. Ingonia, I think. Ingonia, Ingonia. also in New South Wales, some 100 kilometers or 62 miles from Bjork, Bork. Bork, New South Wales. Just Bork. Two police constables, McCab from New South Wales and McManus from Queensland set out from Wiglet Wiglet Walget 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 New New South Wales to catch the Bush Rangers but became lost. Oh no not McManus <laughs> <laughs> fucking the other one <laughs> It's easy to get lost in the bush. McCab and McManus <laughs> no <laughs> not the bush <laughs> the bush claimed them <laughs> Goddamn yeah. bush. The police patrol stopped for supplies, and you, you, you literally just said this for me. <laughs> oh, uh, Ingonia. Ingonia, and we're making a purchase at the Shear, Shearers Inn with Pearson's and Rutherford's. Entered the inn, yelling, "Bail up!" Both constables <laughs> opened fire, hitting Pearson in the arm, and <laughs> roused while Pearson returning fire, hitting McCab in the chest. Damn. <laughs> Damn it. The two Probably Bush. Bloodshed. Yeah. The <laughs> Bush Rangers then fled to uh, Balali. Balali. Ba- Balali, where they stole fresh horses before continuing down the Darling River to near. 
Poncari. Poncari. I'm pronouncing it Poncari. <laughs> where you know it's Poon. <laughs> Poncari, where they s- split up and went their separate ways. Pearson traveled north, robbing several stations along the way before heading toward Mount Gunderbuka. Gund- Gunderbuka. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> 70 kilometers or 53 miles south of Bork. Uh, police party tracked Pearson to Mount Gunderbuka, but he eluded them in the thick scrub of the mountain, based at the foot of the mountain, and stationing men at the water holes to prevent Pearson from access to water. The party chased him for. F- Three days before capturing him on Christmas Day. What a nice gift. What a nice yeah. gift. <laughs> In a small cave, uh, weakened from lack of water, badly bitten by bull ants. Ah, oh, shit. Ooh, ooh, shit. That's the worst thing to get. <laughs> uh, fucking... <laughs> this is the cont- worst type of ants to be bit by. Uh, unfortunately, Contable McCab had died from his injury in November, and Pearson was charged with murder. Committed for, oh. tri- committed for trial on January 4th, 1869, Pearson was found guilty at trial on May 3rd, 1869, and sentenced to death. <coughs> the sentence was later committed hmm. to life imprisonment, and he was released in 1884 after 15 years. He must have been on good behavior. He must have sucked a lot of our dick. <laughs> yeah, that's what's always weird is it seems like, like the a lot of these uh, like justice systems are almost like some some other than like the real corrupt like police. They almost seem a lot more lenient than they are now. <laughs> I know, <laughs> like regards. he 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 killed a cop, <clears throat> and they just let him yeah. free after fifteen years. Yeah, you you ain't getting out of fifteen years to kill a cop in a year. <laughs> oh no, you're lucky if you even make it to the prison without one of the cops accidentally killing you, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the com- the communication the com- the communication oh of communication his, the communication Com- commutation the commutation of his sentence was. Controversial, uh, there is some evidence to suggest that William Munnings Arnold, uh, uh, fucking parliamentary, parliamentary? speaker yeah. of the time, may have influenced the, dis- the decision. Are they trying to say that, um, he's, this Arnold, this William Munnings Arnold was the, was related and got him out? Is that what they're trying to say? The com- the commutation of his sentence was controversial. There is some evidence to suggest that William Munnings Arnold, parliamentary speaker of the time, may have influenced the decision. So yeah, maybe he was maybe they're like people are, are mad about like them like over sentencing stuff and he probably got lucked out and got a pardon. Yeah, probably because he was related <clears throat> to the guy. Because he is Yeah, because I think that I think that happened with uh That with, is uh, probably Clyde. That is probably where um, the rumor that uh, he was related to a family with the surname Arnold came from was because of that little incident right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, according mm-hmm. to legend, in 1884, Bush Rangers stopped at the local police station in B- Barmera, South Australia, where they locked the police in their own cells. The leader of the gang then rode his horse into the bar of the Overland Corner Hotel and carved his name into the wall. No trace remains of the name and his identity is disputed, with some claiming it was Captain Moonlight. However, it is known that Pearson was active in the area at the time. I don't think we covered Moonlight. Moonlight. We will cover him. I know that for a fact. We will cover him in the later <laughs> Captain season. Captain Starlight, Captain Moonlight, Captain Midnight. <laughs> hey, man, these guys, you gotta give it to them. They had some hell of a name. They, they, these are fucking, even, they're anti-heroes, but they had fucking superhero <clears throat> names. 
<laughs> before before that was a thing. Yeah. <laughs> Especially fucking Frank pa Pearson. He was definitely a Joker uh, character. He he definitely was just like winging it, <laughs> just doing whatever he felt like doing, confusing people, probably being all crazy. Yeah. Probably had some a lot of a lot of tales of things that have never happened. He yeah, just endlessly sure. entertain you with. <laughs> They'd be detailed enough that you'd you'd be like, this. I feel like I know that this is bullshit, but there's so much detail that I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So later in life, Pearson returned to Queensland, and and in 1887 was arrested for forgery and false pretenses under the name of Frank Gordon. Come and change the first name. Alias Doctor <laughs> Lamb. <laughs> Doctor Lamb. Yes. Uh, tried and uh, he he was tried in Rockhampton and sentenced to a year in prison in Brimsbane. He was uh, admitted to Bugo Road Jail and shortly afterwards transferred to Saint Hella Island. It was while imprisoned where that Pearson boasted that he was the inspiration for Boldwood's Captain Starlight. While in prison, he met fellow prisoner Major Patrick Edward Pelly, and from his release, Pearson adopted the name. God damn it, he's stealing identities now. He's not even being original. He's not even being original anymore. <laughs> Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the real uh, Captain Starlet? <laughs> Upon his release from St. Helena, Pearson was rearrested, tried at Toowoomba, and imprisoned again as Frank Gordon. God damn it. <laughs> Come on. Come on, man. <laughs> In the Toowoomba jail. <laughs> In the Toowoomba jail for another three months. As Patrick Frank Paley, he lived in <laughs> South Australia for around two years working as a drover. He is not known to have committed any serious crimes during this time. In 1896, he moved to Perth where Major Patrick Francis Paley, he was employed at, on the recommendation of W.A. Premier Sir John Forrest as a clerk accountant with... Why are you letting this guy handle money? <laughs> with the Western Australian uh, Geological Survey in Perth, he often related uh, elaborate and false stories of his past as a major in the British Army and a major of the Russian <laughs> Tsar's bodyguards. Yeah, oh, a member. Go. Yeah, a member of the of the Russian Tsar's. <laughs> there you go. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> he was. He did fucking go around telling <clears throat> bullshit stories. You were right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> On December 22nd, 1899, Pearson died after accidentally swallowing cyanide. <laughs> Why the was fuck is there just cyanide laid around? <laughs> he I was guess for rats. <laughs> I guess he was drunk and mistook it for his medicine. He was buried in Karakata Cemetery, Western Australia. Oh... Damn. <laughs> Basically, death by Tide Pod. <laughs> Just like, oh, I got, gotta take my medicine. Oh, this, this fucking bottle. That, yeah, you know it had the Jolly Roger on it. You know it had the mm -hmm. fucking Jolly. This, this bottle with the Jolly Roger it will uh, fix me right up. <laughs> <laughs> It's like you you didn't want the bottle with the rat on it. He thought it was the bottle with the the wombat on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have one more Frank. 
One more Frank. And we have Frank Gardner. Was an Australian bush ranger who gained infamy for his lead role in the robbery of a gold escort at Eru- Ooh, Ugara, Ugara? Ugara, New South Wales, in June 1862. It is considered the largest gold heist in Australian <coughs> history. Gardner and his gang, which included bush rangers Ben Hall, John Oma, uh, O Milly, Johnny Gilbert, Henry Maines, Alex Fordsitz, John Bow, and Dan Charts made off with a pile uh, of cash. We want to, we want to try those names again. I, I would have it would have been fine, but we we got a I think we got four of those wrong. <laughs> John O'Mealy, Johnny Gilbert, Henry Maines, Alexander Alexander Ford Dice. Four dice. Are you sure that's not four dice? I think that's four dice. I, four dice or four dice. I, I am unsure. John Bow. Uh, the, e, the E at the end makes it an I. Uh, okay. I'm pretty sure. John Bow and then uh, Dan Charters. And Dan Charters. I, I'm not sure which ones I got wrong there. I... I, you, you, uh, uh, you said Dan Charts, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, then there's, then there's Dan Ford for uh forties, <laughs> or Alexander forties. <laughs> but yeah, uh, we got it now. We got it now. All right, all right. You said four though. That that's what confused me. <laughs> Made off with a pile of cash and seventy-seven kilograms of gold, worth uh, about ten million today. Oh shit. After several years in prison at, for the robbery, Gardner was exiled and moved to the United States where he died on or about 1882. Spoilers! <laughs> <laughs> Gardner, on, born Francis Christie, was born in 1830 in Roshire, Scotland. He migrated to Australia as a child in 1834. Also aboard was Henry Munro, a wealthy Scottish businessman who would soon form a relationship with his mother Jane. In 1835, Munro appointed his father, Charles Christie, as overseer of his property and personal cuck at Borough Creek, <laughs> south of Colborough. In 1837, Mo- <laughs> Mar- I was just saying it right. Monroe obtained the lease uh, for a property on the Camps... Camp... 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 Campaspe? I don't know if it's... Campaspe? Might be Campas. Campaspe (laughs) Plains, about 80 kilometers northwest of Melbourne, with Charles, again, the overseer and personal cuck. By 1840, Monroe... Had the lease on another run near Hotspur, about 50 kilometers north of Portland, in western Victoria. Once again, Charles was overseer and moved the f- there with the young family to be the personal cuck yet again. <laughs> 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 All right. Gardner's appearance was six foot four inches tall. He had an athletic build with brown, with a brown wavy hair and hazel eyes. He was described as attractive, with a face of corsair and a smooth voice. So we're dealing with a Ben. No Kissel. one. Fucks like yes, Don. No one sucks like yes, Don. <laughs> <laughs> dealing with. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say. I don't know if we're dealing with the, the bin exactly, other than the, uh, other than the height. <laughs> I mean, uh, I guess it depends on your taste. Hey, <laughs> I wouldn't say he's an athletic build. Ben is an athletic. What? What? 
<clears throat> he's a burly man. <laughs> he's burly, but more like beer burly. <laughs> I, I, I guess, but he does. When I have think of course... athletic, I'm thinking he, of like a. I'm he, thinking of someone who's like built, built. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I'm I'm going for more when I, especially when it's athletic of the time. I'm going more. They want a big beer burly man. You know, Ben Ben can mm-hmm. lift stuff. <laughs> he can lift stuff, but I don't. I don't think he. And of course, he he he, <laughs> he does. He, he his face is corsair and fucking, sm- and he does have a smooth voice. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it, okay, the hair. The hairs might be different, but his hair has become brown and wavy now. So. <laughs> True. Okay. I'll fine. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> and he has hazel eyes. Ben has hazel eyes. I've never seen Ben's eyes. He's, he's, he's you got to pay. He squints you, a little bit. I got. You, <laughs> you should pay attention more on uh, on the uh, the side ex, side story experts. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, the early career in 1850, Gardner was working as a stockman in central Victoria, perhaps realizing that his career meant hard work and little money. He and two uh, accomplices stole a large mob of horses from William Morton's station near Serpentine on the Lod- Loden. Laden. Laden. Laden, 40 kilometers <clears throat> northwest of present day Bend- Bendigo. 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 <laughs> back, they in, planned... back in Bendigo. <laughs> <laughs> they planned to sell the horses in Portland. However, Morton followed their tracks in Bilston's Inn near Haywood, he- Haywood where the trio was arrested. Gardner was tried under his real name Christie at Geelong on October 22nd, 1850 and sentenced to five years hard labor. On March 22nd, 1850, Gardner was part of a work party working outside Port Ridge Prison when they rushed the guards and escaped. Most of the convicts were rounded up within days, but Gardner escaped and made his way t- to New South Wales perhaps stopping at the station in central Victoria where his father and young sisters was living and probably getting cucked. There was, uh, there <laughs> are scattered reports of him having been arrested at uh, McVoll Diggings on suspicion of robbery, the gold escort the previous week. However, there is no record of him hearing in court <coughs> in this matter. It is likely that he hmm. moved up to New South Wales and to team up with a youth named Pryor, Pryor. to yeah. resume his horse stealing career. In February 1854, Garner, now calling himself Clark, uh, and Pryor was caught trying to sell stolen horses at Yaz. This time he was sentenced to 14 years, 7 years for each charge. He is getting off super fucking light for horse theft. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Usually horse theft, the first horse theft you did back in the this time period was death. Yes, queen. <laughs> so you, you got hung. It was literally hang, it was mm-hmm. a hanging offense. Yeah. Though, I mean... It doesn't seem exactly as consistent in Australia as it did, like, with, you know, America, where they'd just be like, yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess it was more of an American thing. than I, I guess in Australia, I guess since horses were more abundant, I guess, because I know in America it was because you, that your horse was your life, man. <laughs> there, or maybe it was just because they kind of are going more on, like, the, the English system. I think even back then, at that time... Like the English law was was a little bit more lenient than American law. <laughs> gotcha. Well, while in prison on Cockatoo Island, he met Bushranger John P. 
Paisley, Frank. Yeah, we've Clark. seen Cockatoo Island a lot. Yeah, Cockatoo Island's gonna come up a lot. To to be honest, uh, it it'll have to be later, but Cockatoo Island will probably come up in a like a, a like we'll probably do a series where we cover like infamous prisons and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Cockatoo Island will probably be in that because it it comes up a lot, especially when yeah, it comes it to bush rangers. It seems like the Australian, uh, like, Alcatraz. Alcatraz. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Frank Clark, uh, which is Frank Gardner still. Frank Clark was granted a ticket of leave in December 1859, conditional on him staying in the Carcor District. Car- Carcor? District. Yeah, I'm just going to go with that. Calling himself Car- Frank... Car- Hardcore. Yeah, I, I, I won't have to it. say it again, it looks like. So, calling himself <laughs> Frank Johns, he opened a butcher shop at Spring Creek Lambing Flat, but he was arrested in May 1861 on a cattle stealing charge and committed for a trial, but allowed bail. He then absconded, after which it was discovered he was a prisoner absent from his district. Gardner joined with Paisley for a short period and was briefly captured after a gunfight with two troopers at Fogg's Hut near Reed's Flat. Gardner and Fogg managed to bribe one of the policemen to allow Gardner to escape. Hmm. So the I like getting getting the bribed dudes. right after you had a gunfight. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I know I just tried to kill you, but come on, you know, yeah. No hard feelings. Eh, well. <laughs> All right. It, so. it does pay for shit, I guess, <laughs> being a cop. <laughs> Especially compared to, like, all the shit you have to do, just, like, wandering the bush looking for all these crazy-ass bush rangers. <laughs> uh, for sure. Uh, in June 1862... He bailed up with Lankland Gold Escort near... Ah, oh, god damn it. Ugara. Ugara with a gang including Ben Hall, Dan Charters, and Johnny Gilbert. This Johnny Gilbert. This holdup is considered to be one of the largest gold robberies in Australian history. The total value of the gold in banknotes taken was estimated at 14,000 pounds, approximately 12.5 million pounds in 2012 terms, which is a hell of a lot of money today. I don't know why they're giving uh, that. Apparently, they're not giving pounds, they're giving American dollars. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) oh. The random, the random, here's an American in American at 2012 for some reason. Yeah, that's going to be a lot more today. That That's going to be at least 22, I'm going to assume, now. I have no idea. I We could do the calculator, but let's just continue on. Much of the gold was re- recovered by mounted police after they surprised the gang at Wego. We we ago we we awaga we we ago we ago we ago we ago we ago we ago hill near Forbes. What happened to the remaining gold is still the subject of much speculation and rumor. The cops probably took it. Treasure hunters mm-hmm. still visit the area, <laughs> and it is even rumored that two Americans who were thought to be gardeners and nephews visited Wayoga station near the Wendens in 1912 claiming to be miners. What does the fuck does that have to do with the gold? Uh are they saying <laughs> did, were they, are they implying that they were they 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 found it? I <laughs> I guess so. But I'm I'm going to assume the cops took the gold. If if most of the gold was retrieved you know them cops took some of it. Come on. Yeah, I mean, I, they're already they're already really easily being paid out. <laughs> it's not above their it's not below their character. <laughs> All right. While the rest of the gold robbers stayed in the district and were rounded up and caught, Gardner opted to flee to Queensland. In 1863, 1864, 
Gardner was living with Ben Hall's sister-in-law, <coughs> Kitty Brown, at Caps Creek near Rockhampton, Queensland, where he was running a general store. He was recognized and reported to the, to the police in Sydney. What the fuck? What's he doing? What the <laughs> hell, dude? That That's bullshit. It doesn't Snitches. Seem- it doesn't seem like he's had any deaths. It doesn't seem like he got into one shootout and he robbed a shit ton. He had the biggest heist in recorded history. What? What the mm-hmm. hell, man? <laughs> <laughs> Gardner was apprehended in uh, controversial circumstances by both New South Wales police operating outside their jurisdiction and by troopers of the Parliamentary uh, Native Police. Paramilitary p- native police. One of the oh. New South Wales policemen used Gardner's own horse, Darky, during the capture. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> it, it was a it was a black you know it, you know it was a black horse. You know it was I, a black horse. I, I know it was I know it was a black horse, but it, it's it's kind of a funny thing that it could be associated, but it couldn't be. But that is a very Australian. Uh, slur. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. He he was taken <laughs> back to Sydney and sentenced in July 1864 to 32 years hard labor on the roads. In 1872, a petition was organized by Gardner's sisters seeking Darner's early release, prepared for a uh, presentation to the newly appointed governor. Of New South Wales, Sir Hercules Robertson, the the governor as representative of the English sovereign, had the power to exercise the royal prerogative of mercy for felony cases not subject to the death penalty. By the time it reached the governor in September 1872, it had attracted the signatures of a number of Tormented public men, including members of parliament and the former uh, Colonel Secretary William Forster. After consideration, Robertson decided that Gardner could be a. a, a oh, what, what, what's it? <laughs> Uh, I, 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 the, the, where, I'm, I'm looking back where after consider after uh, con, we're at the very end after consideration Robertson decided that Gardner could be eligible for pardon but only after he had served 10 years incarceration and providing his condition in prison remained good conditional upon him leaving the country on release and becoming an exile from Australian colonies and New Zealand. That ain't a bad rap. Ten years and then uh, gotta be good behavior. Sorry about the eligible that it was uh, it was uh, getting mixed up on me. Oh yeah, you're good. I, I couldn't find where we were. <laughs> But yes, uh, San Francisco, this is the exile. In late 1874, Gardner arrived in California, having traveled via Hong Kong. He is just one of million Australians' exiles from from this country during the Bush Ranging era. Uh, Gardner owned the Twilight Star Saloon at Kenry Street in the Barbary Coast area. Kearney. Kearney Street in in the Barbary Coast area of San Francisco. A couple of months later, he relocated to a more upmarket Brandon Street, which was closer to the docks. Australians arriving in San Francisco would often ask him and have... A drink at his premises. By 1882, he was out on the street. It was reported that Gardner had overextended credit to his clientele and couldn't pay the bills. There were numerous reports of his death having occurred in 1882. 
Evening Noon, Sydney, August 28th, 1882, and other similar articles, and that he was buried in Pepper's grave near, in a paper, Piper's grave near the Legion of, Piper? of near, near the <coughs> Legion of Honor Park in San Francisco. The circumstances of his death are not known with any degree of certainty due to in large part of the destruction caused during the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. There are many rumors about his life there, including a claim that he married a rich American widow and had two sons. Another rumor was that he died in Colorado in 1903. None have been oh. proven. Hmm. And I wonder if there's like a weird mock, uh, mock Garner. site of where they, where they say that like, I wonder if there's like a cool little uh, you know there's trap in Colorado that's like you know this is where uh, one, he actually died. You know there's that <laughs> one town. You know there's that one town that. Uh, yeah, I want to go to. I want to find that town here, <laughs> <laughs> even it's if it's not clean. true. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I would live there and then start my bush ranging. My Colorado bush ranging. Yes. I guess mountaining. <laughs> <laughs> a mountain ranger. <laughs> Alright, so that was the three Franks. And, like, all... Yeah. It's gotta end with us fighting a boss. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna take my controllers. Oh. Here we go. <laughs> Where's you bitch? I think she's over here. Jason. Miss it. Jesus. Or that was the other witch. If it was saying you weren't dealing damage, most likely it was there. No, I did a little bit. I just actually missed a bunch. Oh, no, no. He's being a little rowdier than you do. She's up on the, she's up on the top. I saw it. Oh, that's the other one. Oh, maybe not. No. Yeah, 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 it was. Uh, we've done some 
green. Yeah. No! No! Damn it! Oh, oh no, no, no! Press the bastards. Oh, she's trying to shoot me. Two. Yep. Damn it. Where are you at? Mm. Oh, why you got a puppy guard? Oh god! I'm stuck. You good? Yeah, I'm good. Ooh, You're getting me. too close. You're getting too close. Where are you? Oh, I'm right here. Ah, oh, fuck, I missed. Oh, you're here. Oh, yes. Oops. All right. <clears throat> and that will be a bye-bye. Bye-bye.